This is the second video about building an economic theory. In this video, we look at how to develop, evaluate and test the theory that we've built. In our earlier video, we developed a theory which attempted to explain the uh, level of exam scores that students can attain. And we argued that the main variable would be the number of hours of study a week, having taken account of the intercept term here for other factors, but we assume them to be constant. And we, the, the red linear line, you may recollect, suggests that the greater the number of hours of study a week, the higher the exam score. The problem with this theory, however, is in its linear version, because the constant slope suggests that each hour adds the same percentage to the exam, irrespective of how many hours you study. So in other words, early on when you've done very few hours will yield you exactly the same um, through extra study as if you've done, say, 10 hours of study. That doesn't seem very realistic. So let us modify that, uh, that, that theory the, of a linear relationship. In this slide, we're going to modify our theory by assuming, remember it's just an assumption, we have no evidence at this stage, assuming the relationship is a nonlinear one, which is represented now by this curvilinear line. Let's look at the implications of this new line. Just as before, we look at the intercept and the slope. Well, the intercept has no change because we're looking at the relationship between the final exam and the number of hours of study. And all we're doing is seeing how each extra hour of study contributes to the exam mark. But intelligence and all those other factors stay exactly the same. So if a student the curve suggests that if a student does four hours of study, it will yield the same as before, an extra 40%. However, an extra four hours of study yields only 10%. So you can see the slope is positive, but it gets flatter and flatter as more and more hours are spent studying. So the slope's positive value, it's like a hill, has a positive slope, is falling. The positive value gets less and less as the number of hours of study increase. So let's look at the theoretical implications of this new curvilinear line. We still have the uh, conclusions that we set out in the theory initially that more hours of study will gain students higher marks. However, the curvilinear line suggests that there are diminishing returns as the number of hours increases. So in other words, students get less and less marks for the same additional effort. So how could we explain this? Well, this is where economists may differ, of course. Some economists may argue that, well, initially topics are easy to learn, so you can gain scores in the exam quickly, but other topics may take longer because they're more difficult to learn. And so uh, you've got to spend more and more time to get on top of those topics, and the return is less and less. On the other hand, some people may argue, well, you absorb less as you get fatigued from extra study. And of course, as you get more fatigued, so you may find alternative activities more attractive and you don't concentrate as much, and so on and so on. Now, but you must remember, of course, that Ketra's Paribus applies. If the Ketra's Paribus conditions change, then this is going to shift the whole relationship upwards, as is illustrated in this graph. So what you're saying is, for four hours of study, whereas before you 
could gain, let's say, 60%, shown by this point. If you change the Kedras Paribus conditions, then, for instance, if you assume that the students that have uh, come into the class are more intelligent, then the average score will be something like 70% for four hours of study. So any Kedras Paribus conditions will shift the curve up or down for that matter. For instance, that may also be caused by an easier examination paper. The final stage is the stage which involves testing the theory that we've developed. So what we do is we go out and we survey our students and we find out how many hours of study each has done. So each dot here represents a student in the survey. The student has done six hours. We then see that with six hours, he appears to have a, a score of just over 40%, but some brighter students may be able to get 80%. So there's a range of possibilities for six hours of study. So what we have to do is use statistics to find the li line of best fit, which gives us an average view of the class's performance as related to the number of hours of study. Now, just by looking at this scatter of points, we can see that there's definitely a positive relationship. It seems that you get, on average, students get a higher score if they study longer hours. And there even appears the scatter takes a curvilinear sort of shape. So we use advanced techniques and we fit a line of best fit through those points and it looks like something like this. So it's con confirming our curvilinear theory. It's now up to us to, to try and explain why this is. But we can conclude that the statistics appear to show that to, to pass and I was get 50%, on average a, stu a student needs about four hours of study. But to get a distinction up here, 80%, you need uh, about 10 hours of nine and a half to 10 hours of study. We're now in a position to form policy based on our theory. We have our theory, we have validated it using statistics, and all of this gives our theory much more credibility uh, from a policy point of view. Now, Policies may involve various ways of boosting exam marks. For instance, we could use a policy uh, of enrolling only brighter students, which would tend to shift the curve up. That's what, our that's what our theory would predict. On the other hand, we could spend more on teaching quality, which would change the slope of our curve, make it steeper, so that even the less bright students would be able to perform better. Notice, however, that both these options, and I've, there are many more, of course, both these options have credibility. Which is the best one? Well, economists are no better at predicting which policy is better, because making a statement like a policy is best is a normative statement. Okay, so what are the conclusions of these two videos? Well, firstly, we concluded that reality is complex, so we need simplifying theories. And we've shown that graphs allow for a rigorous evaluation of different theories by looking at the slopes and positions of those graphs and then arguing through their logical conclusions. We need also, we've seen, to test the theories using real-world data so as to statistically validate those theories. And then we have shown that most policies, good policies anyway, are based on validated theories. However, there is room for different theories and often you will find economists who put forward different theories and people interpret them as factual because they assume the economist has done that validation process. So when you are uh, listen to news reports, you should be always suspicious as to whether these are in fact factual, validated theories, or simply th uh, that they are 
unvalidated theories. Different policies, of course, may result from different theories. And you remember the joke about laying economists end to end and never reaching them never reaching a conclusion. Well, this is a, a, a good example of where economists are seen as having different viewpoints based on essentially the same uh, theory, but focusing on this different aspect of it.